and then we can uh, now move on to uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Stott, uh, recently joined as the head of security and extremism at Policy Exchange. Uh, and like I said in, uh, in the beginning, also has been affiliated with uh, SOAS and the University of Leicester. And he's an expert on the nexus between, he's an expert on British jihadism, but he's also an expert on the nexus between British jihadism and the region of South Asia. Also, you have the floor. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to Junaid and his team for organizing this event. It's a shame we can't all meet in, uh, in person, but hopefully that will happen in the future. Now, I've tried to share my screen there. Can you see my slides? Or does anything need to happen at your end? No. Uh, no? No, can't see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now someone is here. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so uh, hopefully you've got my, uh, my slides there. But I want to really begin with a bit of an assessment uh, in terms of uh, where we are at the moment with regards to, to terrorism and technology. And certainly in terms of assessing any terrorist organization or radical uh, group, I think we've, we've long looked at issues around the capacity of that group, its capability and its intentions and the, the technology uh, that a group has or its ability to adapt new forms of technology for, um, uh, for, for terrorist attacks has long been important. And it's, it's at times been a sort of bellwether of, of how a group's progressing or what its thinking is. So an example from the Northern Ireland uh, conflict, endless IRA uh, attacks on police stations, particularly in rural areas, Police stations would build higher and higher uh, security fences, uh, walls against mortars, and the IRA kept adapting their mortars so as to be so as to fire them over and into uh, police stations to kill police officers. So this really is sort of classic asymmetric warfare, where you have a conflict between two or more uh, groups, but where the, the belligerents are not of equal power usually terrorist groups uh, are attacking stronger forces. But uh, technology has the potential to, if you like, level the balance between those differing forces. And if we go right back to the conflict in the 1980s between the Mujahideen uh, and the Soviet Union uh, in Afghanistan, you read a book like uh, The Bear Trap uh, on that, uh, the Stinger missiles, which the Americans introduced to the conflict, was seen by many as, as vital to uh, defeating the Red Army, encouraging it to leave. And indeed, so important were those missiles, the Americans spent a lot of time and money buying them back after the Red Army had left. Also in the modern era, there's been a degree of, of fear that terrorist organizations may be able to access either chemical weapons or uh, even uh, some form of nuclear uh, weapon in order to carry out uh, attacks. And that was uh, a fear brought to some life by the, uh, the Japanese uh, cult Om Shinrenko uh, back in 1995, who carried out sarin gas attacks on the Tokyo Metro. And there's a long literature on whether Al-Qaeda or not were ever really uh, pursuing this route. We do, though, have, I think, a, 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 a test case in, in real time as to where technology and terrorism may go with the unfortunate events over the past month or two. Taliban's victory and its collection of materials, both from departing US forces and from the Afghan army, um, ranging from um, all sorts of um, high tech uh, monitoring equipment that the Americans had through to enormous amounts of vehicles uh, and guns, I think do present a case that this is perhaps the best equipped terrorist group in history. And just to illustrate as to the direction 
technology may potentially take us into uh, the future. We've seen this year uh, a nation state, Israel, uh, it seems, uh, assassinate uh, an Iranian nuclear scientist using a remote controlled weapon. Um, but the idea that things like remote controlled weapons or uh, even robots may be used by states and that that technology will never spread to non-state actors is, I suspect, fanciful. Now, in my next slide, that may look like an advert for a, a Toyota sales room or uh, the latest version of the Land Cruiser. But this is a, an image of a, a man called Talhar Asmal, who's on the far right of the screen, who was part of the, the Diabandi, uh, group in the Diabandi community in Dewsbury in Yorkshire. And this is a, an image of him and other uh, Islamic State fighters in 2015 before they carried out an attack on uh, an Iraqi oil refinery. And they used the cars here uh, that you'll see as um, what's known as uh, VIEDs, uh, uh, vehicle-borne uh, improvised explosive uh, devices. And this was in a, in a period where Islamic State had already begun to utilize what's commonly known as drones, but uh, uh, technically known as, as UAVs for a whole series of features in um, both Syria and Iraq. So carrying out reconnaissance, uh, directing vehicles such as this uh, in order to carry out, carry out attacks, taking them away from roadblocks, et cetera, et cetera, and also filming both propaganda uh, videos and indeed filming attacks. So although we've given quite a lot of thought and debate uh, to the various rights and wrongs, human rights debates uh, around uh, Western governments, for example, using drones to, to attack jihadists, groups like Islamic State have been very active in this field, uh, developing uh, drones themselves. So by 2017, there'd been at least 121 Islamic State drone attacks in Syria and Iraq, usually uh, utilizing a sort of commercial drone that somebody can buy in a shop um, uh, anywhere in the West if they wish, and uh, fitting hand grenades or uh, large caliber rounds to those drones. So a great example, if you like, of, of sort of leveling up uh, by terrorist groups utilizing technology. Having looked at some of the sort of hardware material, um, others have, have spoken better than I, I think, can uh, on the issue of, of, of propaganda. But uh, I do think modern technology has made it easier for terrorist groups to disseminate propaganda globally than ever before. And just as a, a sort of mini case study on that, compare the Britons who went out to join the Taliban or who took part in jihadist training in Afghanistan uh, first time round, if you like, from 1995 to 2001, to those who went out and joined Islamic State in Syria. And quite simply, most of those who went out to Syria, if they wished, had access to uh, smartphones, access to social media, to email accounts that could be used to encourage friends and family to support them, to encourage uh, others uh, and influence them towards going out and also to record their own activities in the battlefield. That was much, much less common indeed. What happened to, to, to a more limited extent last time round in, uh, in, in Afghanistan was people sending information to a sort of central uh, holding house. There was a, there was a website in London, uh, azam.com, that was eventually prosecuted for uh, supporting the Taliban and uh, uh, some of the Chechen jihadists in that period. But basically a smartphone allows anybody to, to be a producer to produce material if they so wish. And I think crucial to this is the, is the PDF, the ability to, to save a magazine, a publication, and then um, disseminate it around potentially thousands of people who themselves can do exactly the same thing. So even if a website gets taken down, once those PDFs are out there, then it's very difficult to stop them. 
And I mean, that's why some of the terrorism, counter-terrorism legislation in the UK has tended to focus on uh, addressing uh, possession of materials, um, bomb making guides, um, advice on travel to conflict zones, training manuals, et cetera, et cetera. How does this play out in uh, practice? Well, this is an example really, which, which shows you the range of directions in which uh, individuals may, uh, may interact. We've got uh, Mohammed Aftab Suleiman, who's uh, from Manchester, uh, holds dual British and Pakistani citizenship, went out to Syria with a charity, but then decided his talents uh, were best utilized in Pakistan, where he was uh, developing extremist materials, had a, uh, had a studio. And on his return, for the, uh, return to the UK shortly afterwards, was arrested, uh, possession uh, of uh, material of, of use to uh, terrorists possessing those documents. So again, things like PDFs. And he'd also been putting uh, videos in support of uh, Islamic State onto YouTube. So we don't just have the, the organization centrally uh, necessarily disseminating this material, but supporters uh, as well. Now, having put out the, the case of, of how dangerous technology may be or how technology can be a motor for terrorism, I, I think it's probably right to bring a bit of balance to the discussion and set out some alternative viewpoints. And the first, if we remember uh, the deadliest um, a jihadist attack in the UK, 7-7 back in 2005, the bombing of the London Transport Network. That reportedly uh, only cost the attackers £8,000, using mostly homemade materials and rudimentary uh, instructions which they gathered on visits to Pakistan and in the frequent phone calls which Mohammed Sadiqi Khan, uh, the gang's ring ringleader, was making to Pakistan right up to the day before uh, the day before the attack. So they didn't necessarily need to be, you know, an enormously sophisticated uh, uh, approach here. Talked a little bit about um, drones. Um, Gatwick Airport was at the centre of uh, an extremely peculiar uh, business just before Christmas in 2018. Speculation that uh, environmental uh, extremists uh, and possibly uh, other uh, people from other ideologies were flying drones at the airport um, in order to disrupt flights, uh, to disrupt aircraft. And this led to uh, a shutdown of the airport, uh, over a thousand flights being cancelled, but a major police investigation it, uh, was unable to uncover any conclusive evidence of anything other than people seeing some lights which could have been drones. So we, we, we were in, the, in the, the mix, if you like, uh, of a panic here. We thought there was uh, terrorists out there utilizing drones with little or no evidence. And I give a, a similar uh, case from the, the 1970s where it was believed that uh, the IRA were using helicopters in remote locations in the UK to steal explosives from quarries. No such incident was happening, but uh, a, a myth, if you like, developed that it was. So just to, to draw things to uh, a conclusion, I think we can certainly say that um, technology influences two of the most important aspects of terrorism, both the, the, the physical uh, conflict, the use of, of bombs and explosives, and then uh, the absolutely crucial propaganda war which follows physical attacks. We do though, uh, bearing in mind some of those latter uh, cases need a sense of proportion. However, we also need to be realistic. And I think the, um, the technological armory um, that's currently being held by uh, the Taliban is a very serious matter and a very destabilizing matter, potentially not just for that region, but globally. And just to perhaps leave on a slightly pessimistic note, I've given the, uh, given the impression of, of just how important innovation is, uh, mentioning uh, Islamic State and, uh, and its drones, talked about um, 
Northern Ireland, there is no guarantee in a conflict uh, between those who are innovating and trying to counter uh, innovative terrorist groups that governments will always win. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paul Stott. Uh, very interesting, very interesting presentation. Also, again, the, the British jihadist uh, nexus, uh, which, which you have shown. And there's actually, you, there's one question uh, which directly comes to my mind to, to actually put to you now. Uh, you talked about, of course, the threat of, of terrorist organizations or people having the threat that terrorist organizations can get hold of chemical or even nuclear uh, weapons. And there's this question with someone has posed, it says that there was recently an, an, an interview of uh, the ex-National uh, Security Advisor to, to President Trump on the BBC, uh, Bolton, where he says, and, and this is a quote uh, which has been put to me, so I, I, I'm not sure whether it is the exact quote or not, but I, I, I guess it is, uh, where he said, says, quote, I have tried to cut Pakistan slack because of the importance of not allowing those nuclear weapons to get in the hands of terrorists. Um, and then he goes, but we have got to make very clear to Pakistan our patience is at the end. So when you talked in your presentation, you not trivialized, but it seems that that threat is not that urgent or, or very much present in, in view of, of scholars who are studying this topic. Uh, while the previous NSA uh, Bolton says it is very present. So what's your view on, and especially of course, the nuclear weapons in the region, which the closest is of course, uh, Pakistan probably. Yes, yes. Um, I, I mean, obviously there's been a, a long history of controversies over Pakistan's nuclear uh, program, particularly uh, the AQ Khan uh, scandal, which uh, people will be aware of. Um, I think you have to look at things in terms of um, the Pakistani state is a rational actor, and I do believe it is, both its, its permanent state, it, its military and intelligence um, figures and, and, uh, and agencies, and indeed it's uh, most of its senior politicians. It is not in their interests um, to let, it, let their guard down with regards to those nuclear weapons, and that they would face... Um, potential uh, annihilation from the United States, from China, their close ally, and indeed other uh, nuclear powers is almost certain if there was any question about the security uh, of those weapons. And uh, I think that would be my line very firmly on that issue. 